be completed as dialed. Please check the number and dial again. 8188L. But the real Satan and his demonic cohorts are actively on the job. He has an IBM PC now. 40 meg hard drive. He's all caught up to the rest of us. Welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us, where we are still using old microphones. Yes. Uh, having a little bit of technical difficulty on the sound today, mostly because I'm trying to do something a little bit different. And we've got some cool stuff going on in the video, uh, but other than that, this is an alternative. This thing that you're listening to on Facebook, maybe MP3 later on, is a podcast, is a video uh, blog, is a stream of consciousness every week around this time. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is all all can stop us and this is an alternative to netflix an alternative to the creative creative Saskatoon, music canada the ria the ntaa and all sorts of other things if you're spending time listening to this you're not spending your time listening to those groups and today we have a couple of things to talk about unfortunately no guests today which is kind of disappointing but that's okay and as promised i a couple of musical things that I let play the first one. Uh, oh, and my MP3 player is already picked out. Oh, so, this wasn't recording. Oh, no. What's going on with the MP3 player? So many technical difficulties today. So many. Yeah, none of that got through. Awesome. Okay. But in any case, this is the upcoming song. It's from the, a group called the Mannequins. Now, Mannequins uh, were one of the bands that shared their music on the front page of the Pirate Bay. And so they were a basically group that saluted the pirates for what they were doing for them as a as a band. And they're actually they actually sound pretty good. So hopefully you enjoy them. I, the whole album actually sounds good. But this is definitely the best song on the, the whole album and certainly the most polished I think these hands. So I'm gonna rig this up to play and hopefully you enjoy. Oh, 
to these hands. Um, there's something I've been trying to kind of put together, put on today. And so I'm going to try to, to put through the keyboards into this audio channel. So you guys will hear the keyboards. And then later on, you may actually hear more than that. But we're going to give this a try. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. 
across the fields, plucking strings and catching them. Let's try and still run on and on above the river clear. nice when your music doesn't fall off of your music uh, stand onto your keyboard, right? That That is the best. <laughs> In any case, that's just something I've been kind of playing around with today. I don't know if that's actually going to go anywhere, but I see my wonderful sister did me a huge favor this week and uh, gave me a camera, which is actually quite a high quality camera compared to my other one and will allow me to do higher quality audio at some point in the future. And so, yeah, recording still working good. So, this is still being recorded on my old one because it has a, micro, or a microphone plug and the new one does not. And it's not a matter of hardware anymore that's keeping me from having crystal clear friggin' audio. It's actually totally software, which is embarrassing because the software is of, co is of course open source. And so, technically, it should be possible to do the kinds of things that I'm trying to do here without tripping all over myself. But, okay, so in the meanwhile, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk about this week, other than music. Music, music is always fun, but there's, the, there's been a couple of things over the past couple of weeks that I've wanted to talk about, but it hasn't really been topical for the, the particular episodes that we were kind of in. And so the, the first thing that has been kind of like at the back of my mind the last couple of weeks is there was a big argument about kind of the, I can't even remember which particular political problem it was. But there's, there's this like feeling of, of hopelessness in that, yes, we could vote, but uh, what's the point, right? Or we could do this, we could sign a petition, we could go out and protest, but what's the point? And I want to point out that it is worth considering that the problems in our world could be addressed if enough people work together on them. And that the way to get that to that point, where there's enough people working on them, is to start chipping away at smaller, more achievable problems in groups. And in particular, to work together with other people collectively to solve problems. Now, the, it is possible to make little change in our immediate environment and to have the powers that be actually have to react to it. In the past month or so, uh, Hong Kong has had some really serious protests that the mass population in Hong Kong has come out. And despite the fact that there's serious chance of the weird things kind of arrested and sent to the mainland, or people kind of being beaten up in the streets, or all the kind of usual stuff that you have expected to deal with in a protest in China, hundreds of thousands of people came out, and at least for the moment, they got their demands. Their demands were to at least stop the, the bill that was going to pass to make it so that people could be extradited more easily to the mainland in China, and they got that. Now, it wasn't a permanent win, it was just a temporary win, and they all knew that. But even still, it was something that was kind of a foregone conclusion, kind of like uh, SOPA in the United States, and the Three Strikes Bill uh, in the United States, SOPA and PIPA. And the same thing there, like the... the Republicans were for it, the Democrats were for it, the big money was for it, the media industry was for it, the international organizations like WIPO and whatnot were for it, and all the media was for it. And so it was a foregone conclusion that you couldn't possibly stop it. And that it didn't matter what you had going for you, there's no way you could stop a bill with that much bipartisan support. But people came together from across the political spectrum to stop it, and they did. Everyone from uh, Justin Bieber to Hector, and when he was still alive, Aaron Schwartz, you had people on the right, you had people on the left, you had the social justice warriors, you had people who would later be campaigning in the streets against the social justice warriors. Everyone was on the same page. And, sure enough, when millions of people stood up in protest, that was stopped. And not only was it stopped, when people inside the halls of power of the U.S. government started to really start to act caref more carefully when dealing with digital issues because they knew that it was possible that people could be mobilized. And sure, the halls of power have gotten better at misdirecting protests, at misdirecting co-opting culture, at uh, taking 
the, the ways that people would protest and subverting them, and taking the media that w they would organize protests and subverting and capturing them, and doing things like capturing Reddit. Reddit didn't used to be a tool of corporate power. It used to be a, a tool of social change. That was what it was kind of designed to do. But it was indeed captured and is now more just like a reactionary tool. Same thing with Twitter. Twitter came out of the anti-media movement and uh, was a way to get across ideas of uh, which large corporation was doing terrible things and how to stop them, as I've kind of talked about in previous episodes. And uh, I should really stop fooling around with this recording device, but <laughs> in any case. Uh, so there have been tools available to us, but you don't need technology for this necessarily. Paper and pen is enough. Just being able to express yourself and communicate with a couple of other people is more than enough to have some effect, and, and a large effect, not necessarily you know, a world-changing effect, but you can do an awful lot with just you and your words, as long as you choose your words carefully, and you choose your audience carefully, and you choose your battles carefully. And this is actually something else I wanted to kind of talk about, uh, which is the idea of tactics, and the idea of resistance tactics, and the idea of if you are, I mean, we are at the point now, as I've kind of talked about in other episodes, where we've got concentration camps out there. It is plausible that terrible things are going to come out of those concentration camps. We do have every interest in stopping them. And, and the question at this point isn't whether to stop it, it's how and can we stop it. And as individuals, can we actually work together to do this? And so it's worth looking back to see, well, what did uh, resistance movements in the past do? Well, as some of the actions that the resistance movements in the past have the halls of power, they've kind of already covered that with bills like C-51, the Anti-Terror Act, and our restriction from being able to protest publicly. Uh, but there are things that you can do. And it's worth talking to the people around you privately uh, to kind of get a sense for how much they're willing to participate in such things. But, and again, you have to kind of choose carefully who, especially in the, if you're in the States, uh, kind of who you talk to and how. But the, the way that things worked in the 20th century is that there were small groups of people, small cells of people, who would get together and have an idea of something they would want to accomplish, and then they would accomplish it. And of course, the thing that they would accomplish, sometimes it was legal, sometimes it wasn't, right? And so, but the, the end result is that if to separate out groups of people who know what other groups of people are doing in such a way that one group of people doesn't necessarily know what the other group of people is doing. And so to have as much division, or I guess separation between uh, the, the parts of your life that are directed towards social change and actually acting to affect that social change and uh, people who, I guess, just don't need to know the specific details of it, right? And so, for example, is it possible that some people may be in a position to prevent the, the company that's providing vehicles to ICE to keep those vehicles from getting to ICE in some way? Is it possible that you could arrange for that? Uh, for sure. Uh, the, the company that provides vehicles to ICE is a pretty public company. It's, it's worth looking them up. But the, it's worth making it so that the people who, to, who do the action of keeping that company from being able to give uh, vehicles to ICE are not necessarily the same ones who know and are, are kind of, let, let's say, more public in their opposition. How about that? Because the people in the, who are more public about their opposition, it's, we, you don't necessarily want them in directly involved because if they're, if they're caught, then the, the people who are publicly opposed can kind of be sent away. But anyway, well, long story short, the, there were resistance movements in 20th century Europe when it was occupied by the Nazis. They were very effective in slowing down the Nazi effort of exterminating the Jews. They were very effective at looking to see at what, how to make things more expensive for the regime. They were effective and the tactics worked. Uh, and it's worth looking up those tactics and trying to replicate them in your day-to-day -day life and to start to look to see, oh, hey, can is it possible just to have some, a couple of people in my life that are ready to do things, to do political action, but to not have this be a traceable activity? 
Now, again, it's worth talking about as far as how, how far you want to go and do those sorts of things is kind of up to your particular ability to tolerate risk, et cetera. Anyway, that, that's kind of enough. I wanted to kind of go on to that. But the, the third thing I kind of wanted to talk about is this idea of what is journalism in the 20th century and what, are the space, what is the space for someone who's not, who hasn't gone to J school who is willing to do research and is willing to go out and actually record information as it is happening. Not necessarily from an unbiased perspective, of course. Everyone's got their own biases. But being public and open about their biases and being open about whether or not they have some high level of credibility that you'd expect out of a mainstream journalist or a mainstream journalistic publication. And right now the Internet is just filled with crap information sources. And crap sources that are just openly, uh, not, na not even necessarily biased, but just sort of broken in some way, shape, or form. Like, there are new sources that will push supple dietary supplements on you and who will promote sort of fear and division and you know, even outright hatred for their particular outgroup and then will sort of cover it up or, and then, then on the top of that will like sell you things to make you feel safe. Or maybe there are, there are new sources that are, uh, are totally into herbal supplements and talking about natural things and are willing to just sort of completely ignore what science actually has to say about the things that they talk about. And part of this isn't necessarily their fault. Part of it is the fault of, on the, sci the scientific community in terms of a lot of their research is behind paywalls and behind locked doors where the public can't really see it. But at the same time, there is a need for people to have some kind of local to them, some kind of local to the things that they're interested to um, information source. That it, and that information source should have some journalists kind of in, in the wings somewhere, somewhere in their network, somewhere in their... Like it, it, it's, a, it's not a good idea to have your entire world have like no journalists in it at all. No one to like double check any claims whatsoever. Uh, if you do that, you're going to run into the situation that stuff like Natural News has, where people just don't do the research. And they get a lot of things really, really wrong. And so you want to kind of avoid that. But at the same time, there is a, a use for, like, th there used to be a website called Bog. Now, Bog was not really a news source by, I guess, a, a normal way of looking at it. But it was kind of a news source. Bog was disgusting, and it had a lot of really terrible imagery in it. But at the same time, the things that it showed you were, in a sense, real. They weren't photoshopped. They weren't, it, it wasn't something fake, right? You, you, you weren't getting something that was totally concocted. You were so, certainly getting something that was biased towards the extreme and biased towards the unusual. And like there, there's a, kind of a, a way of looking at news in that if it's covered on the news, it's probably not important to your life in that uh, if, if you're watching the news and it's talking about things like the uh, federal government and terrorism and wars overseas and stuff like that, nine out of ten times that stuff isn't directly uh, applicable to your life. Now, obviously, if everyone <laughs> just sort of ignores wars in the Middle East and ignores things like AIDS and ignores things like terrorism, the problem can spin out of control. But most of the things in your day-to-day -day life that you're going to die from are not going to be terrorism. And most of the problems in your day-to-day -day life are not probably going to be immigrants. And most of the problems in your day-to-day -day life is probably not going to be something like some poison or toxic thing coming out of a smokestack covered on... I mean, I mean climate change will <laughs> probably impact us on some level, but... Uh, again, it's, it's worth also considering there are more local concerns in our day-to-day -day life. But kind of back to Bog, Bog showed the truth, and it showed the truth in a visual form, and showed the truth in a way that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily be willing to see or interested in seeing. And for those people, that's fine. But their, their life was not such that they could, you know, their mental health was not ready for them to expose themselves to the truth, the ugly truth of what actually happens in the world then fine, that, that's, that's good for them. If they want to fill their life with more positivity, that's, that's great too. But it's worth having around, and it's worth at least having an option to, when you're interested in seeing what's going on in the world, to have something where you can see what's going on in the world, even the extreme things, even the ugly things, even the dark things, even things that make you feel uncomfortable. 
And that's kind of how I see the real concerned citizens of Thunder Bay, in that they aren't really, they, they're very open about, and you can actually go and talk to the guys who run it, like they're very open that they're not journalists. They are biased, they miss details, they get some details wrong, they screw up, they, they cover things that maybe a responsible, respectable journalist wouldn't. But when they show you a picture of someone's dead dog, you get to see the picture of the dead dog. And I don't think they make that shit up at all. I think they're actually showing you what's going on. And they, they make their living on the tragedy, and they make their living on the suffering of the people in Thunder Bay, the poor and the defenseless in some cases, and, some places, and in some cases just the assholes, right? They'll, they'll be there if there's a fight and people start picking on kind of innocent people or innocent bystanders or just each other. And it's ugly, it's unfortunate, but this is also the city that I was I, that I lived in, and it was good that at least someone, at least someone recorded it, at least someone had a reference that you could point to and say, yes, actually things are pretty rough down by Victoriaville. Like there, there are issues in Thunder Bay, and here's an example of them: here, 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 and here, and here. Now, unfortunately, as kind of mentioned in previous videos, I think he's being sued from left, right, and center to kind of shut him up because some of the things that he says is, well, it's ugly, and it's, people don't like it. And yeah, he's gotten some details wrong, and for sure, some people's reputation may have been hurt by that. On the other side, it's a place for you to go to get the kind of dirty nitty-gritty, and if they are successfully censored in silence, there will be no place to go, and you won't be able to go to see what people's dead dogs look like in Thunder Bay, and you won't be able to see the ugly truth of what actually goes on in the city, because no one else really covers it. No one else really records it and makes it into a publicly accessible uh, document that people can then refer to later when they go to think, how could we improve the city? Where are the issues? Where do people not feel safe and why? Et cetera, et cetera. So, and then that kind of brings me back to this show which is, in a way, really not that different from the real concerned citizens of Thunder Bay and Bog in that sense, in that I'm not a journalist. I'm just some guy. I see what I see. I record what I record. I, I share what I, should, I choose to share. And I try to, to bring and highlight things that I feel sh people should have some knowledge of or some awareness of. And it's worth considering that if what the real concerned citizens is doing is somehow totally unacceptable and that they can be sued out of existence, what really stops the, next, the, the people that sue them from going to the next step up? One of the things, there's this article I'm going to try to link to uh, with this video here, um, that, about, that Thunder Bay is a case study in news poverty. And one of the things that they point out is that there are media outlets in Thunder Bay. There is the CBC, there is a Chronicle Journal, there's APTN and T-Bay Newswatch, even though uh, other than APTN and CBC, basically all media in the city is controlled by one company. And the difference is, though, is that unlike normal media, most media in Thunder Bay doesn't have legal. They don't have a lawyer on staff telling them what they can and cannot print and what they can and cannot get away with. And when the, their lawyers are in kind of uh, high demand and they don't really have access to lawyers to protect themselves as publishers, as news sources. What they do is they do, or es especially things like CBC will do, uh, is maybe not CBC, but like the, the bigger companies anyway, is they will basically just not publish anything remotely controversial and not publish anything remote that could be challenged because they aren't willing to fight for it and they haven't got the resources to fight for it even if they were willing. And so you can't rely just on individuals like the real concerned citizens of Thunder Bay. You really do need some bigger news organization to do it. And you don't want to have people who took the bailout money from the federal government and the Trudeau government because they're corrupt as all hell. So where do you turn? There's basically nothing. And so because there's basically nothing, we have to kind of make do with the sources of news we have. And part of that is going to be swallowing our, our, our kind of uh, dis taste and just checking to see what's going on on the real concerned citizens once in a while. Same thing again with my show, right? It's it, in the absence of people uh, who have the legal resources to defend what other people are saying, activists who are willing to just publish, publish things 
regardless of the legal consequences, are kind of the next best thing. Ideally, you'd have something better, but this is what you have. Use it. Anyway, the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about is one of the things I've been doing in the past uh, week or so is working, uh, uh, again, with the NDP. And, uh, again, uh, disclaimer, what I say has nothing to do with NDP policy, does not represent the NDP in any way, shape, or form. I am just some guy who happens to be working alongside the NDP. But I've been going door to door in one of the, actually a couple of the more dangerous neighborhoods in Saskatoon. And some of the people close to me have been worried about me, and, and rightfully so. I, I put my bike and locked it up to a, a King George school, and with, literally within two minutes, there was someone trying to steal my bike. And I was still on the street kind of watching him do this. And so I'm like kind of looking him in the eye going like, are you really trying to steal my bike right in front of me? Like, is this how this is going to happen? Now, I had a pretty big lock, and that lock was going to work, and it was unlikely that he was going to be able to, to break through it. Although, uh, oddly enough, that, that lock did die a couple of weeks later, so who knows, maybe it messed with it or something. But he, it, it's still just worth pointing out that these neighborhoods are dangerous. You can get stabbed. And sure, I mean, as kind of Jerry uh, has pointed out, that, or my, I guess my friend Jerry, the, the chance of getting stabbed is not all that high. I didn't get stabbed. I didn't get jumped. I was fine walking around. But you could tell, like, there was a guy who got stabbed at the one block that I was at 10 hours before I was there. Just some 30-year-old guy. It seemed to be a random act of violence. It could have been me. Easily could have been me. And so why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about that there are streets in Saskatoon that are dangerous and that I have been walking among them? It's because I am not afraid to walk through these streets for uh, my country. And the, it is, it's ev even silly to compare it. But there have been people who got out of a boat in, on the shores of Normandy and on the you know, shores of Northern Europe on Juno Beach or whatever, and in full uh, machine gun fire, walked across a beach with you know, barricades, and they had to kind of go through an area where they had to like go through a pl place that was like really deep water and still somehow make it out of the water again while being shot at, and they were willing to do that for their country. Who the hell am I to not be willing to walk through a dangerous street that people in this city live on their entire lives? And some of the people I talked to have been living there for, like, many decades. So they've been there for quite a while. You know, and who the hell am I to not be willing to walk through just in the open daylight through city streets of the city that I live out of fear for my personal safety when those other people, again, stood on the, that beach and took that beach at great risk to themselves in an exhausting and grueling ordeal Again, in full machine fire or machine gun fire, uh, there's there's no contest. If they were willing to do that, then I should be willing to do what I'm doing today. Because the stakes are not even like again, the stakes aren't even as high, right? Like I I should be willing to take that step if it means removing a, a, a potential autocratic leader from this country, right? It, these are the steps that you should be willing to take if you care about your country. And this is the step that I'm willing to take, is to go out in places that are not necessarily safe and to go out there and actually try to, to reach the hearts and minds of people who live there. And this, if, if this is how I get to check out of this world, then so to hell with it, right? This, this, is, something, this is something that needs to be done. And so that's kind of what I wanted to kind of rant about that. The next thing, uh, kind of going along those lines, is like it's worth considering that there's, there are things worth fighting for. And one of the things is, uh, again, there are these concentration camps that are built out there. Now, in, the, in this specific case, I had actually a couple of links. So this is from uh, May 3rd, 2019, uh, from Reuters, China p putting minority Muslims in concentration camps, USA. Uh, again, from writers. The United States accused China on Friday of putting well more than a million minority Muslims in concentration camps. In some of the strongest U.S. condemnation to date of what it calls Beijing's mass detention of mostly Muslim Uyghur mi minority and other Muslim groups. The comments by Randall Schreiber, who leads Asian policy at the U.S. Defense Department, are likely to increase tension with Beijing, which they did, which is sensitive to international criticism, 
and describes the sites as vocational education training centers aimed at stemming the threat of Islamic extremism. Now, that being said, if they if China were to do something about Islamic extremism and never mind extremism, just like Islam, vocational educational training centers would probably be a, one way of kind of approaching the problem. And given how big China is, those training centers would probably be pretty large. That being said, you would also be able to lead them. This is kind of similar to the, the U.S. Uh, camps, where basically they say, oh yeah, the difference between the, the American camps and the German camps and the British camps is that the, the American camps you can often leave and you can get deported, even though, in fact, as we've now seen, it's harder than to get out of those camps than you may expect. And it's harder to get processed through those camps than you may expect. Hold on. It's been a warm day. Very thirsty. Anyway, former detainees have described to writers being tortured during the interrogation at the camps, living in crowded cells, and being subjected to a brutal daily regimen of party indoctrination that has drove some people to suicide. Sounds like such a fun and happy place. It's, it's definitely got kind of a, the flavor of a non-European format. Like, I, do, I don't recall reading in the the tales of the German concentration camps of indoctrination. The the Jews who were kind of locked inside those camps were so, kind of seen as both expendable and lost causes. So they didn't try to reform them per se. But anyway, continuing on. So, quote, some of the sprawling fa uh, facilities are ringed with razor wire and watchtowers, which again, that it definitely screams like I can leave this whenever I want, right? When you ring the place with razor wire and watchtowers, yeah, that's definitely uh, training facilities, right? It's like <laughs> the some of the the elementary schools in Saskatoon when I was growing up uh, downtown were looked from the inside a lot like I kind of imagined prison to be uh, with stuff like razor, not necessarily razor wire, but certainly things like bars on the windows and. It, it, it gave that kind of visual impression. Same thing kind of going on here. We're like, what is functionally the, the institution we're looking at? Is this a education center or is this a internment center? I think when you put razor wire and watchtowers around something, it becomes more of an internment center, just saying. Anyway, continuing on. The, quote, Chinese Communist Party is using the security forces for mass imprisonment of Chinese Muslims in concentration camps. Scriber told a pentacle... Pentagon briefing during a broader discussion about China's military, estimating that the number of detained Muslims could be, quote, closer to 3 million citizens, unquote. Now, this is kind of where, about as far as I wanted to kind of get into this. So they're saying basically that it's at least a million, but likely closer to 3 million people locked in these camps. Now, again, where, where are we in, in this world where we are openly talking about concentration camps with millions of people in them, this is the starting to approach the worst of the 20th century. The worst of it, not, not like just the beginnings of it, the worst of it, where we have millions of people locked up in concentration camps, where the, it is becoming harder, harder and harder to resist legally, where the avenues of protest and the avenues of peaceful resistance are being locked away from us. So we can't do anything about them, uh, except, again, in the, the medias that we kind of have left. So it's, it's worth thinking that, hey, this is something that's going on. And when we are, for example, having an election in, here in Canada, when the political parties have platforms, they should be talking about the, these camps, both in the States and in China and in Australia and in France and in other pl parts of Europe, where there is a crisis going on worldwide that humanity is, is losing what it means to be human. And I, I remember reading a, a, a history book. It was written before the Second World War. And it was talking about how in the First World War, there was this kind of darkness that spread over humanity. And the, the, the basic care that humans, human beings had for one another gave way in that great, quote-unquote, great war. And so much tragedy happened, and inhumanity happened. And people looked at that and went, yeah, that was humanity itself. When people talk about crimes against humanity, this is kind of why. It's because the, the most basic parts of our goodwill just seem to evaporate when people were willing to do terrible things to each other on the scales they were willing to do. And we are approaching that same condition today, where the, both in China and in the United States and in Australia, people are being conditioned to just accept that there are 
large numbers of people that are going to have terrible things done to them by the institutions in their lives, and that's just life. Well, that's not how things have always been, and it doesn't have to be that way. And especially in the case of Xinjiang, we don't have to put up with it. We can, I mean, there's, there's, China has got a lot of power right now. The government of China, the, the Communist Party there, it's, it's, it is a very powerful institution. But all institutions can have pressure put on them. And it is possible to start acting against it, to start making it more expensive for them, to start making them see what they're doing to humanity. And it's worth thinking about having, at the highest levels to the lowest levels, discussions about what to do about these concentration camps. Anyway, continuing on. The other thing that I think I kind of talked about in one of the, the previous episodes, is, but I did read the NDP New Deal for the Climate Action, which is kind of not the NDP's party platform, but a specific document about climate change as an issue. And so the long story short on that, or the, some of the highlights is, one, that they're, they're just outright talking about stopping fossil fuel subsidies. And I was just reading that past couple of days, there's something like $3.3 billion being approved just this, this month uh, that the federal government can be putting into fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of like a win-win-win because one, when the federal government stops paying for it, the federal government doesn't have to go into debt to pay for this, this subsidy doesn't have to raise as much taxes, et cetera. Now, the people who rely on that fuel, they may end up getting kind of the short end of the stick. People who live in remote communities who may be getting some of their gas subsidized from that, uh, maybe on reserves, for example, they are going to have a, a lot of incentive to switch to some kind of an alternative because that subsidy is going to go away. Now, the, the good news is, is that there are going to be alternatives. The NDP are estimating they're going to create about 300,000 jobs doing things like retrofitting, uh, if not every home in the country, uh, a lot of them, creating uh, carbon-free electricity out of the wide by 20, or sorry, 2030, uh, which is actually pretty soon. That's like a decade away, less than a decade. So that'll be like converting Saskatchewan, converting other places in the country to solar, geothermal, wind, etc. Working with First Nations to do it, providing support for workers who are impacted by the shift to a low carbon economy, i.e., workers, not corporations. And this is something like one of the kind of people who live uh, near my parents is he lost his job because the carbon tax came in and it became more expensive to transport goods across the country. And he was in the, involved in the industry of transporting goods, and he was one of the jobs that was cut. Now, the difference between the NDP and the Liberal plans and the Conservative plans is that when the NDP provides support, it's going to aim to provide support for the workers who are impacted. So in the case of people who lose their job because of carbon tax, there will be support and programs for those people to, to find better employment, to, to, to find other employment, to maybe get retrained, etc. They're going to push for, they're making a big push to have the federal government lead on electric vehicles, in fact, converting their entire fleets to electric electrification of municipal transit, working with municipalities to make bus fleets electric. To They have this plan of creating a high-frequency rail line along the Quebec-Windsor corridor, which, again, unfortunately is not anything like adding a Regina-Saskatoon path or a Thunder Bay to anywhere path, but at least it's investing in rail. I think somebody in the previous episode mentioned that they were talking about EV rail to make Canada manufacture more electric vehicles and to put pressure on the auto manufacturers to ma manufacture electric. They are going to reestablish bus routes uh, abandoned by Greyhound and to run zero emissions buses, to work with indigenous and northern communities to move off of diesel with renewable r microgrids and transmission connections. So like this is actually like a lot of stuff that they're planning on doing. And there's no, no kidding it's going to be at 300,000 jobs. They're going to do this in part with by creating something uh, called the Canadian Climate Bank. So like kind of like a Bank of Canada or IMS style bank specifically for climate change projects and to basically lead the world in tackling climate change. So this is what the NDP is going to do. Now, that's kind of the good news and that it's going to support low-income Canadians, Indigenous remote communities, and workers. There is a little bit of bad news, though. It's going to be, it's, you, it's mixing the single-use plastic issue with the climate change issue, as if they're the same issue. Now, in some way, little way, there is a kind of connection between the two, but they really didn't have to do that. And I think they're doing that 
for the people who just don't get how important climate change is as an issue, but who still kind of understand that environmentalism on some level is, has some good things going for it. And so the single-use pla plastic thing, personally, I think it's a bit of a poison pill that's going to keep the conservatives having something to attack uh, in the bill. But maybe there's a, there's a reason like that that they have it in there. So, so that, that's kind of the, the, the rundown of, of, of that. It, in general, it's a good plan, though. And it's a, a really, a, it's a plan that is exactly as much of a, it tries to be a leader, or like express leadership in, on this issue. And Jang Meet Singh, or, who, or who, I guess he's, he's the one responsible for this. At the end of the day, he signs the, you know, on the dotted line saying that this is part of policy. He has done a good job on this one and should be applauded, and it's worth supporting. And, and if you compare it with the Green Plan and, and the Liberal Plan, it's not just good enough. It's, it's actually like take, taking a good couple of steps above the status quo and above what would normally be considered kind of polit politically feasible and tries to, to increase the overturn window of what is acceptable on, that we can do on this issue because we have to. We have to act on it. And they're willing to actually to make that actually happen. Again, again to it, as long as they're kind of elected. No. So that that was going on. And then another thing I was kind of happened while kind of walking around talking to people is somebody asked me, it's like, why carbon tax? And the conservatives love to freak out about the carbon tax and love to point out about how it's a new tax. And just like the GST, where the liberals promised that there was going to be no new GST and that there was going to be, once the GST was there, it's not, it wasn't going to be raised. And, and same thing with the, the income tax originally. Once you have a tax and a new tax to cover, even in the case of where, where there's something important to pay for, like the First World War, it gets really, really hard to get rid of a tax once you have it. And so there's this tendency for these taxes to just kind of accumulate. And so people are kind of justifiably skeptic when they get something like a carbon tax proposed to them. And Trudeau, to his credit, has implemented a carbon tax. And although we're still working out the details, and the PPC would get rid of it, and the Conservatives would probably decrease it and mess around with the formula to allow the polluters to just pollute anyway. But why have one? Well, when we have a global issue that d uh, democracies and capitalist countries around the world have agreed is an issue, and has agreed that there is a common interest in doing something about that they, one of the most kind of effective ways of dealing with this particular kind of issue where pretty much everyone, I mean, literally everyone emits some carbon dioxide. When we breathe, we breathe out carbon dioxide. But there's some people and companies that pr produce a lot of carbon emissions and some that produce very little. And the companies that produce a lot, it is possible for them to reduce how much they emit. And, and in some cases, entirely. And it's possible to have whole sectors of the economy changed at the margins, so like a, just little by little, on little initiatives, little projects, to reduce their, their footprint here and there. And it's the net result that we're concerned of. We're concerned with the net amount of carbon dioxide put into the air every year. So that carbon dioxide emitted minus carbon dioxide taken out using stuff like carbon capture, trees, plants, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we're putting this tax onto companies and individuals to encourage them to be more sustainable in terms of how they're impacting the atmosphere and then using that tax to deal, I guess, with the issue on kind of the other side. So you take that tax, those tax dollars and invest in ways of, of reducing this cost in the future. This is kind of like a two-step approach to dealing with this large problem of climate change. And so when people say, well, why do we need a tax? It's like, well, one, is, is there just like a lack of knowledge that there's climate change happening, that two, human beings are responsible for it, that three, we can actually impact the climate, and that four, we can choose how much we impact the climate based, among other things, on how much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we emit, and that five, when we tax something like that, you're going to get less of it. And so with those five things together, the, ra the rationale does make sense. Now, we could argue about what the, the money collected from such a tax should be used on. Personally, I think sh it should be used to pay off the deficit. But as, 
as far as taking it and investing it and putting it on in climate initiatives, you could probably do a lot worse. So there's kind of that to consider. One of the other things I kind of wanted to talk about is, oh, and I lost the link. I really should have grabbed the link here. Um, here we go. So uh, it's worth reminding people, because I, I don't think the newspapers in Canada really talked about that, is that despite all the talk of the Trudeau government being LGBT friendly, and despite Trudeau of going to pride parades or whatever public events he's gone to and put on the fancy hat or funny hats or whatever and tried to make himself seem like a quote-unquote ally of the LGBT community, the government of Canada has been funding export of internet censorship technology that specifically targets LGBT people and it, it is specifically targets them to do things like hunt them down and kill them and hunt them down and track them down so that their protests can be um, dealt with and so that they can be arrested and, again, killed in places where it is not legal, unlike Canada, where it is legal to be gay. But this is something that the Canadian government is subsidizing. This is something that our tax dollars go towards under the Trudeau government. This isn't a, a Harper government policy that has just sort of continued on. This is something that the Trudeau government has been notified that this is going on, and they've continued to do it, because like the arms trade to places like Saudi Arabia, at the end of the day, human rights are not all that important to the Liberal government, and they may be actually get in the way of their, their actual policy goals. And so when we look at the Trudeau regime and its impact on the world and its impact on L LGBT people, uh, we shouldn't let them get away with saying that they're pro-LGBT, because... They're, they have blood on their hands. And when you, I guess, promote and fund technology that does this, the net result is going to be dead LGBT people. And so that is something that we should not let them live down in this election season. We shouldn't allow them to, like the conservatives sometimes will, will kind of be afraid that, oh, the, the LGBT lobby has the Liberal Party in their pocket or something like that. Well, don't let them have that. Don't let them. If, if you know someone who's gay, make sure that they know that the LGBT or that the Trudeau government funds murder of LGBT, LGBT people worldwide, and it's it's not it's not something that Canada should really be doing, and yet we are. But it's just yet another example of something that Canada has become over the years under the Trudeau and Harper governments, which are basically, in many ways, including this, indistinguishable. So there's that, and. The last thing I kind of wanted to get into is the Equifax. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the Equifax, the outcome of the Equifax class action lawsuit and how you can get $125 uh, in the settlement. You, as a person listening to this, uh, if you're in North America at all, or, or probably anywhere in the world, you can get $125 just by taking part in this class action lawsuit. However, I would, hi I mean, if you really need the 125 US, then go for it, right? I mean, it's 125 bucks you can do a lot worse. But if you can afford not to, one, don't participate. And two, you can mail a, a letter to the settlement, basically tell, telling them how full of shit they are. Now, of course, don't use the terms full of shit. This is a letter to a court. So they're going to be interested in well-written, well-thought through ideas of why Equifax as a business shouldn't exist and why the particular settlement isn't ethical and why you as an individual shouldn't be expected to have credit monitoring when the the problem isn't that, oh, hey, someone has gotten your social insurance number or something like that. The problem is the whole system is basically broken at this point. And to a large extent, it's broken because of companies like Equifax. So if you're interested in writing such a letter, I'm going to include the link to this, but uh, you can mail it to Equifax Data Breach Class Action Settlement Administrator, Attention Objection, uh, C slash O, J, N for Neptune, D for Delta, Legal Administration, P.O. Box 91318, Seattle, Washington, 98111-9418. Again, that's Seattle, Washington, 98111-9418. Quote, tell them 20 cents a victim is class counsel selling out the class so counsel get their fees which is exactly what's going on. So that was kind of 
went a little bit over. So hopefully, despite all the technical difficulties in this particular show, it sounds okay. As usual, if you'd like to support this show, you can uh, donate by subscribers to our villages and other media. And if you have somewhere for me to put these files, some media, some streaming video music site or something like that, let me know and I'll look into it. And if you have any creative commons or other kind of pro-piracy mu- mu- pro music, give me a link and I'll give it a listen and play it on my next show, which will hopefully be somewhat less of a gong show. Hopefully you enjoy and tune in next week.